So yeah, so I'll be talking about the home sharing business. So data science challenges in home sharing, bringing it back to, there we go. Oh, there we go. Bringing it to Ron's little taxonomy here. I'll be talking about the bottom left um, bucket, kind of the most, the, the short-term rental um, marketplace. That being said, Airbnb, as Foster said, really operates in a few of these buckets. We, we have uh, boutique hotels, we have multifamily homes. A lot of hosts actually offer uh, long-term rentals in addition to short-term rentals, but um, kind of the bread and butter is in the bottom left. So that's what I'll be talking about most. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm um, a senior data science manager for the Marketplace Dynamics team. It covers a fascinating area. Um, I'm biased, but it's, it's so it includes pricing, monetization, cancellations, competitive intelligence, and supply and demand dynamics. I've been at Airbnb for about three years. Two of those I've spent on the Marketplace Dynamics team. Before that, I was on the host side. And I, as mentioned today, I'm an economist by training. That might come through a little bit today. A lot of the examples are pulling from kind of the economics or econometrics space, but we also do a lot of um, things more in the predictive analytics ML space, but I'll be talking about that a little bit less today. I'm a, before that, I was in economic consulting. So that's when you work on big uh, lawsuits in which you need um, expert testimony, basically. For example, what's gonna happen if two companies merge or do we think prices are gonna go up or go down? Um, you need data, but you also need economic theory to make predictions there. And all of this sort of started with um, me getting a PhD in economics. Cool. So that's me. What's Airbnb? Um, my guess is a lot of you know a bit about Airbnb, but I'll just give a really, really brief um, introduction. Airbnb really is about d democratizing hospitality through home sharing. And we do that through sort of allowing the average guests, the average host and communities to participate in hospitality. And so if you look across the globe um, today, almost or over 2 million guests stay at, in Airbnbs every night. Um, and it's, there's a wide uh, price range, right? So it's kind of, it, you, can, you can find budget options, but you can also find absolute luxury um, uh, villas. Um, similarly, on the hosting side, we think of it's democratizing it. You don't have to be a business. You don't have to have a um, big building. Uh, the average host can host. Uh, you can even, you know, host a, a shared room. Um, somebody stays in your room, doesn't even have a private room. Um, and lastly, Airbnb also um, provides support to communities. So over the last 10 years, we've used our uh, disaster response tool over 100 times. Uh, so this is where hosts open up their homes um, in times of crises. Um, it's relevant right now with the fires in California. Most recently, we um, opened up, uh, hosts opened up, uh, I think it was over 200,000 listings to frontline stays workers with respect to COVID. And there's kind of two reasons that allow Airbnb to quickly respond to disasters or also just events. One of them is proximity. So if you look at, um, We've talked about New York a lot today. I'm going to talk about Boston for a second. So if you look at Boston, if you look at hotels locations in Boston, they're, they're kind of centralized either downtown or Copley Square. If you overlay Airbnb listings, they're kind of everywhere, right? So if there's any event or any disaster, it's um, the proximity to that event or lo disaster location is going to be, it's probably going to be closer. So that's, that's one. The other thing is that supply on Airbnb is, is very elastic. Um, so if there's an event, um, supply can come, come onto the platform. That's different than kind of traditional hospitality. It's hard to build a hotel overnight, but it is actually not hard to list your listing overnight. And an example of that is um, the Eclipse. So I remember this quite well because I started at Airbnb, I think one or two weeks before this start happened. Um, so when the eclipse happened in 2017 and kind of cut across the country, um, many uh, people stayed in Airbnbs, many more than in, in hotel rooms. And uh, what was interesting is that actually half of the hosts who hosted, this was the first time hosting. So they really, there was this elastic response to, um, to the eclipse. So that's Airbnb. Um, where does Airbnb sort of fit in? We talked um, about a few different companies today in different industries. 
I think of Airbnb sort of sitting in at the intersection of a few interesting circles. One is um, online platforms, another is the sharing economy, and a third is uh, real estate. And so that's a bit abstract. So um, I thought I'd fill it in with a few examples of companies you might know, um, or you definitely know. So kind of a behemoth in the online platform circle is, is Google. Um, if you look at the kind of the intersection between sharing economy and online platforms, that also encompasses companies like Uber and Lyft. If you look at the intersection between real estate and online platforms, you have companies like Zillow or Compass. And I'll talk a bit about these intersections and different challenges that um, arise for data scientists in particular at these intersections. So starting with the sharing economy meeting online platforms. So companies like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. So what are some, some common challenges or opportunities that data scientists um, or more broad, broadly these companies face? One is these are all two-sided markets. And by that, I mean kind of two-sided markets in the most narrow sense of the word, because there's more definitions of two-sided markets out there than I think there are two-sided markets. But uh, it, think of a company that I, that, so how I, th I think of that definition is for Airbnb to exist, hosts need guests and guests need hosts, right? That's different than Google, which is sometimes also described as a two-sided market, because if I think of um, searchers, um, coming to Google, they don't need advertisers. Advertisers need searchers, but the majority of searchers coming to Google are not actually looking for ads. It's just Google's monetization strategy. So here it's really the one side of the market absolutely needs the other and Airbnb needs both, both to exist. Another thing that's very particular to, to these industries is supply constraints. So if um, a given listing or a given car for let's say Uber at a given time doesn't, it, you know, is taken, it, you can't get it back. Um, that's, it's, uh, it's, there's a strong supply constraints. It's again, a little bit different than ads, which often you can show the exact same ad to, to the next person. For Airbnb, that's actually, in, in addition, interesting because of the heterogeneous goods. Cars are a little bit more similar, but listings are quite different. So uh, once it's gone, it's gone. Um, a third similarity is, or commonality is supply elasticity. So I just talked about that that um, there, there can be an elastic response um, in, to increased demand through the price mechanism. And uh, a fourth one is that additional supply or demand, let's stick with supply for a second, is not um, necessarily incremental. By that I mean if you, if you add additional supply to a marketplace, yes, it will bring additional bookings but, um, or rides uh, if, you, if you add cars. Um, but all those might not be incremental. They might be stealing bookings from other supply on the, on the platform. And that's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. I know it's something that Uber and Lyft spend a lot of time thinking about. And sort of a, that's the one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Um, I could spend an hour on it, but I'll spend a few minutes on it. Uh, and yeah, the takeaway for data science there is that we really need to understand and measure incrementality um, closely. So I'll give two examples of how we do that. One is on the modeling front and another is on the experimentation front. On the modeling front, we use a kind of canonical economics model called um, Cobb-Douglas. It's used in the um, labor market literature a lot. It's used to describe, okay, you have capital and you have labor and together it produces widgets, basically widgets of any good. And um, Airbnb has used it to describe the, um, our marketplace. So you have supply and you have demand and together supply and demand produces bookings. And you also have a, a efficiency parameter A that kind of sucks up some other things of how well you're matching supply and demand um, in, in a given uh, geography or a given segment. And very concretely how we, how we use this is um, you fit this model, this um, model that I'm just showing right here, um, using historical supply and demand data and um, that's how you get your parameters. You predict future supply and predict future demand, and then you can use the predictions of supply and demand and those parameters you just estimated to calculate the incremental return of adding supplier demand. So concretely, we use this in a lot of ways across Airbnb, but very concretely, one example is if I know the return to adding an extra unit of supply in San Francisco is much higher than in San Jose, 
then, uh, then that's maybe where I would send my sales agents. You know, this is where I would start adding, um, trying to add supply. So that's on the modeling front. We also think about incrementality a lot or have to think about it a lot with, to not draw wrong conclusions on the experiment front. Uh, basically, so imagining experiments where we're treating um, a certain set of listings, we're giving them some feature, maybe a badge, something that makes them look better. And let's say that it really works, like these listings get booked a lot more. Um, and so two things can happen. On the one hand, what could happen is these listings get guests who would have not booked otherwise. That's that green guest here. That's good. That's, that's good variation. On the other hand, what can also happen is that these listings steal bookings from guests that would have otherwise booked from a control listing. So these are not incremental. These are just stolen. And that's not good, right? This will overestimate the effect. And this is what we call cannibalization or interference bias. And there's, there's various ways to deal with it. I'll, I'll kind of touch on three um, cluster experimentation, switchbacks, and double randomization. And I'll just kind of give the high level intuition. This is another one where I could spend at least an hour on each of them. The kind of intuition behind cluster experimentation is to increase the size of the experiment unit so that that interference or cannibalization doesn't happen. So let's say um, I'm looking for a listing in, let's take San Francisco again. I'm probably not going to stay in San Jose. So San Jose is probably not going to be stealing listings from me. So maybe that cluster is good enough. Um, and when you decide on how, how big to make your cluster, you have to think about um, two things. On the one hand, like you might want to make it really large to so take countries. Um, if, I, if I'm going to Germany, there's probably listings in France are probably not going to be stealing bookings from me, uh, maybe at the border. Uh, but the problem with that is we'd have almost no power. We'd have, to be precise, you know, 191 observations. So that's, that doesn't quite work. So um, that's kind of the trade-off, this power and bias, bias trade-off. One way that um, ride-sharing companies in particular have tried to get around this is to add another variation, like another dimension. In addition to um, assigning treatment and control at the geography level, they, they add a time dimension. So what they do is, um, so take, for example, here, if you look at New York, New York is in treatment from 4.30 to 5.30, um, and let's say dr for drivers, then from um, 5.30 to 6.30 it's in control, so on and so forth. The, the pro is that gives you a lot more power, which is good. Um, the con for Airbnb or any you know, real estate um, company is that our search process is just is, is too long for, 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 the, for this to work easily. Um, if I start searching um, for a listing today, I might not book today. It often takes days, sometimes even weeks. So it's very unclear how to define those um, search windows. Very different from, from Uber or Lyft. A third way that we're actually exploring um, a bit more right now, actually, at, at Airbnb is um, double randomization. So this is where um, you break both supply and demand into treatment and control. And then if both are treated uh, in the treatment treated bucket, that's when you apply the treatment. And you can then um, start estimating cannibalization by comparing quadrants. So for example, um, if you were to compare quadrant B to quadrant A here, you're looking at um, control listings, um, but some guests are um, in the, on the treatment side are being stolen from treated listings. So that is pure cannibalization. So this is one way to, to kind of get an estimate, estimate of listing side cannibalization. Let's move on to, before going too deep, um, let's move on to another of these intersections between um, online platforms and real estate. Um, so companies like Airbnb, Zillow, Compass, um, what do they have in common? One is that goods are very heterogeneous. Um, Ron showed a few houses that looked similar, but I mean, the majority, even, even they are somewhat different. And uh, um, for the majority of cases, they're, they're not that similar. So goods are quite heterogeneous. Data is pretty sparse. Um, it means some people buy a lot of houses, but the majority buy houses, you know, once or twice, maybe in a lifetime, um, or with respect to Airbnb, people stay in, guests stay in listings, you know, maybe once or twice a year. So it's, it's not like we have a ton of data coming in. 
Another um, challenge is the long feedback loop. So for example, with respect to Airbnb, um, there's a guest might find a home, then they decide to actually, okay, this is the one I want. Then they contact the host, then the host accepts, then you take the trip, then you leave a review. This in some instances is, is a matter of days, but often it's a matter of months. So it takes a long time for us to, to get feedback on whether, how the whole process went. Was this, was this good? Um, was the guest happy? Was the host happy? Um, and that's kind of the one I want to I want to focus on, which is the takeaway for data science. One interesting problem for data science here is that we need to think about long-term effects um, carefully. Like for for we can't just run an experiment and expect to have all the answers within a few days. Um, one way we've started to think about long-term effects at Airbnb is we devised a concept called future incremental value, um, and the idea is to measure the long-term impact of actions that hosts or guests take. Um, and how that works is, or maybe first let me give an example. Um, um, so imagine a guest um, gets canceled on by a host. There, there's a short-term impact that the guest, uh, that the trip doesn't happen, we lose the revenue, the guest is unhappy. But there's also a long-term impact, which is uh, that that guest might never come back. So that's, that's an example of like short and, short and long-term. And so, so how the, the kind of model that we built of feature incremental value, it, it uses propensity score matching to find a like, guest and host twins who are otherwise identical, but one of them, let's say, gets canceled on, the other one doesn't. Or one of them adds an amenity, we're actually using it for that as well, which ties back to what Foster was talking about earlier. What's if a host adds um, a, um, a jacuzzi, um, what's the value of that? It's not just gonna come right away, it's probably gonna take a few months to, to see the value of adding a jacuzzi. Uh, and so, so one example, we, we've now used this across all teams at Airbnb, but one example of uh, learning that we've had through this is um, how important the quality of a, a good stay is. Um, if you compare a complaint stay to a perfect stay, the, the present value is, is very similar, but the future value is, is higher for the perfect stay, and that's because the guest is more likely to come back. So um, lastly, let's talk a little bit about the um, intersection between kind of sharing economy and, and real estate. Um, this is, gets a little bit spicy and it's um, something that's maybe more particular to Airbnb than, than other companies, but uh, another actor that starts coming in is um, cities or um, municipalities, regulators. Um, Cities' concerns uh, really vary from, from city to city. Some cities want to spur economic development. Um, some cities are worried about over-tourism or have housing concerns about um, long-term rentals being converted to short-term rentals and increasing rents. Um, uh, some, some cities are looking to have more tax revenue. So there's a lot of different um, cities' concerns, and Airbnb really works with individual cities to understand what, what, what they're looking for and to see if we can come to a common solution. Um, one takeaway for data science in particular is that we need to really understand and measure the impact of regulation, both to understand what happened backwards looking, but also to provide um, policymakers with the necessary data to make the best decisions going forward so that um, when they are negotiating, um, they are negotiating um, with all the data. So how do we measure the impact of various regulations? So the ideal for a data scientist, right, would be an experiment. I, could, I would randomly assign some jurisdictions to be regulated and then others not, and then I compare them over time. Unfortunately, it's not how it works. It's usually a very messy process. Um, we decide on a few cities that we work with, um, and uh, and end up with some 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 regulation uh, that usually takes longer than originally um, designed. So what we resort to is quasi experimental methods. So think difference and differences, event studies, synthetic control. One of those is, is synthetic control. I'll talk about that one a bit more. So how how we use synthetic controls is so imagine there's a city. Um, let's call it, so let's say it's Prague. Um, and Prague gets hit with a regulation. So what we can do is we can look at Prague, and that's the treat treatment city, and we can construct a synthetic control city. Um, 
And the synthetic control is basically a, like a weighted combination of other cities that then together look like Prague. And those weights are based on um, data prior to the, the event date. And then you can follow the treatment and control after the event date and see what happens. So Prague here is really what I would call a placebo. Nothing happened in Prague in 2016. So whew, luckily the treatment and control continued to move similarly. So that means our method is working and, um, and, and that's why the, 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 the lines look similar. Let's look at an example where there actually was a shock. It wasn't a regulatory shock, but there was a supply shock. So this was a hurricane that hit um, Puerto Rico in 2017. And when you compare the, it, the treatment, you know, Puerto Rico to its synthetic control, you see a big drop in supply. And then you see supply slowly coming, slowly coming back. If you compare that to demand, demand actually recovers much more quickly. So it also has, you know, drops off like a cliff when the hurricane hits, but then it recovers more quickly. And this is actually tied to make, making a full loop to what we talked about earlier, which is the incrementality. So even if the supply doesn't fully recover, the existing supply that is still there absorbs some of that demand. And so that's why the demand recovers more quickly than the supply. I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, the I hope so, so some takeaways if I didn't do a, a terrible job is that home sharing is, is you know full of complex data science challenges um, those data science data science challenges don't exist in a vacuum they 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 overlap a lot with other industries and other companies and it's really just a very very small sample sample of challenges and um, if you have any questions or if you want to work as a data scientist at Airbnb for hiring as well please um, don't hesitate to contact me. So.